many things. I'm very happy to have an opportunity to speak here. Thank the organizers to make this possible. And I, I would like to also thank my collaborators, Aleta Schkola and Ilya Spitkovsky, which unfortunately are not here, could not make it. Uh, I'm talking about a very simple property in, in terms of a map, which is a midpoint map. It's like an algebraic geometric property of a convex set. And I came onto this topic when I started to look at inference maps at thermal states of the form exponential of some Hamiltonian. And finally, uh, after some time, I realized this map was already used, the midpoint map and its openness, the stability was already used earlier by a prominent group from Moscow. And much earlier even, it was used by, in the 70s by, by people from the community of Choke theory. So I will give um, a report of, of the history a little bit. I have to admit I'm not an expert in Choke theory or in, uh, or in spaces of continuous functions. I will do my best. And then I will comment in this sec in, in the, uh, after that I will comment on the applications in quantum mechanics, which are in continuity of, of entanglement and continuity of von Neumann entropy before going to my results, which we had done with collaborators. So I give you an overview. So we, we can think we, we, uh, we are working still in a norm space, but the Choke theory really works in locally convex vector spaces, which are Hausdorff. We just take three sets to have some notation. K, Y are usually compact, and A is just bounded, will be used later because we want to drop compactness. And then the standard objects to use is the convex, excuse me, the, the continuous bounded functions, which are automatically bounded in the compact case. And we also use the space of Borel probability measures, of regular Borel probability measures. And finally, we, we need a space of affine functions. K is compact, and then there's the basic ingredients for the original theory, which was behind <coughs> stability, was the lower, the continuous envelope property. It means that the lower envelope of a continuous functions is automatically continuous. So how can you, how can you phrase it? First of all, what is a lower envelope? A lower envelope is an approximation of a, of a continuous function which approximates from below in terms of um, affine, continuous affine functions, and it's the best approximation in that sense. First, uh, you have a barycenter map defined. How can you do that? We did, people use a weak integral in that case by integrating on the left-hand side uh, by applying a, a linear functional on the left-hand side of, of that definition to the barycenter and on the right-hand side to the integrand. And so it's defined. And the result was the following. <coughs> One can say that an, a continuous function has a continuous lower envelope in all cases, if and only if, or for all continuous functions, if and only if the barycenter map from the space of measures to the space of, to the compact set is open. And okay, also this is already sufficient. I would like to go a little bit into detail of the proof because it, it leads automatically to the notion of, of um, <laughs> inference. Namely, what can we say? <coughs> Uh, we can rewrite the the uh, the lower the lower envelope not only as, a, as an approximation from below but also an approximation from above. We can do this <laughs> by using measures. You might know this construction, for example, from the entanglement of formation when you approximate from above using a decomposition into the cheapest decomposition of of, uh, of von Neumann entropy of the of the of the marginal. But here's an abstract notion, and it's noteworthy that the space of measures is compact, and the body center map is an affine map, which is also continuous, and onto the space which we started with. Finally, it's, it's important to notice that mm, the affine functions on the, on the space of measures can be identified with the continuous functions, and therefore, we have a possibility to, to generalize this. But I would like to point out that in this definition already, we have, we have 
uh, a natural notion of inference here because we are picking in each fiber of the, of the um, body center map the, the measure which, uh, which minimizes the function f. So you see, in a sense, we are looking at the fibers of a function and we are picking out one point in that, not necessarily one, but we are looking at the minimum in that fiber. And this can be abstractly more generalized. We replace y, uh, we replace the space of masses by an abstract con compact set, and we replace, replace the body center map by an abstract affine continuous map, which is so reactive, and then we can def make a, a new definition to a new function, which is abstract. And Westerstrom proved the result in, in that setting. <coughs> Actually, later, which, which then goes back to the theorem one, because the, the, the abstract um, function uh, f, f v is, is nothing but, but the, the lower envelope. So we have, we have proved the theorem in that setting. Lima generalized the theorem even to continuous functions on the, if you want space of measures, but it, it's just a, space, a compact set. And here, as I already told you, we are in the setting of, of inference if you look at it, because we can just look at the fibers of, of phi and then minimize on that. And each fiber, what we can do is uh, assume that in each fiber there's a unique <coughs> minimum, and then we have already found an uh, inverse, a right inverse to the, to the, to the projection which defines the fibers. <coughs> Uh, to the linear, to the affine map which defines the fibers. <coughs> so we have, we have an a, a, a inference map which, which, which works by a ranking, fi ranking function which should be minimized. And now we can already use the result by Lima and see that this inference map must be continuous if and only if the, fi the fiber defining map or the constraint defining map phi is open. Just keep that in mind for later. Now let's get further to the, to the, in the, into the history. Next step was really to, uh, to get to the stability notion, which was not introduced yet, is the <coughs> openness of the midpoint map. So O'Brien, a few years later, proved that the Parisian map is open, which we already saw before, is possible if and only if the midpoint map is an open map on the compact set and a few other properties. For example, the convex hull of an open set must be open, or the interior of a, uh, sorry, <laughs> the convex hull of an open set must be open, or <coughs> the, the interior of a convex set must, must, must be convex. And so what we can do is to check this on a simple example. The, the best example is just by taking a circle and taking two points in the convex hull. What we see here, the, the extreme points are not closed because one of the points on the, on the circle, it is just this point. It is, it is no, no, no extreme point in, in the convex hull anymore. So what can we do? We can check the continuous envelope property, define a function which on the, on the two apices is just zero, and on the, on the circle it is one, and now it's clear that, or it's known, that <coughs> the <coughs> lower envelope it does not change for a continuous function if we sit at an extreme point, and therefore we have, we have still the value one on the, on the pointed this, on the pointed circle, but we have go down to the value zero along, to the, along the line, and there's a discontinuity of the lower envelope. Also, we can study, for example, uh, <coughs> a cylinder. <coughs> So, a co uh, we, if the, this cylinder which is described here, it cuts out a, a section of, of this object. And if you go we'll look at the interior, how does it look like? First of all, we can describe the bounder. The bounder is just a cylinder surface, which is bounded by these two circles. And the remainder is nothing but the open set. <coughs> and we see if you put a line through and on the top, this line intersects on the sides the open set, but in the middle it intersects the boundary. So it, uh, this set is certainly not closed, the interior. All right, let's skip the next example and go further to the phase, uh, not the phase function, but the stability of phase <coughs> matrices. The nice theory, as I told you, you know, for example, from, <coughs> from entanglement of, of formation, you, you one want to have a way to define lower envelopes. 
Mm? But this compactness theory works not because the state space do not form a compact set. And therefore, there were some clever people who tried to generalize, and they did generalize the theory of stability. <coughs> so the first, we have the standard notions of density operators. We now we are in the setting of a, of a Banach space. And on a Hilbert space, we name it the, the, the space of nuclear operators, of trace class operators. And we have the usual density matrices. And therefore, we have no compact set to study. What we can do, or what, what Herr Levo and Shirokov did, <coughs> they studied not the whole space, which is not compact, but they, they tried to figure out which sets are compact. And they found out that the, the compact sets can be described in terms of constraints on the energy. So you just need a suitable energy operator, which is unbounded and has discrete and finite multiplicity, such a called H operator. And if you take it, then uh, the, the, uh, the states of a given finite energy is a compact set. And conversely, each compact set can be bounded by such a set. And if you add a little bit more theory, then you can already find the solution, namely the following definition is that a mu compact set is one where under the <coughs> Paris and the map from the Borel, from the regular Borel measures to the set, this, this, the, the pre-images of every compact set are compact. This is the whole story. And uh, they try to prove this just by using this uh, condition of what I told you about description of compact subsets uh, using energy constraints and Prokhorov's theorem on compactness, which works on tight measures in, in the space of measures on the set. So we have a mu compact set. And just for a few notes on, on what, what properties we have. Again, we have this property that we can describe a lower envelope in terms of an upper approximation by measures. But we can do also well-known ingredients from Choquet theory, for example, Mil uh, grein millman theorem and the Choquet theory, uh, that we can use boundary measures effectively. This we will see in a moment in work. So, but before we can see this in work, of course, we want to have stability. And this was also proved by Shirokov in 2006. And I, I was reading the proof. It is, it is, it is going uh, some standard operator theory. It's nothing very complicated. The <coughs> theorem then reads as following. <coughs> we have a... a a stability of a mu compact set, if and only if the Paris on the map should be open, and if and only if the lower convex hull of every convex function is also a story. If every continuous function is also continuous. So this is the main, main ingredient for, for the applications, continuity analysis in the following. And of course, we have the partisender maps, which we have seen earlier as open, and the relation to stability. So let me give you the application to entanglement monotones. <coughs> In that theory, we have two Hilbert spaces. And um, there's a theory which says a standard, <coughs> standard theory, a standard construction of entanglement monotones, first monotone means that this map is invariant or non-increasing on the LOCC maps. And, uh, we also need that it must be faithfully, uh, faithfully recognizing entanglement or not. And there is a standard receipt how to do that. And I don't go into all, all details, but one of them is you need a concave function on the state space of one of the particles. And then you, you compute the, uh, the partial trace of a state in the full system and, and evaluate this concave function on one system. And then you take the the cheapest decomposition of any, of any state in the full system, which is, which is described here. So they take the infimum over all decompositions of a state where it is decomposed into countably many extreme points of pure states, and then you evaluate your function on, this, on each of the, of the partial traces of pure states. <coughs> okay. What was proved is that for every continuous bounded function on the state space, we, we can find 
that indeed the entanglement monotone is also continuous. I will go to the proof. In the first part, it's, it's an approximation argument that in each fiber of, in the fiber of a row, it means in the meshes on, uh, supported, supported on the extreme points, <coughs> And we, we, can, we can find the meshes which, have, which are discrete as a dense subset. Therefore, we get that. And we, we, can, we can relax from the extreme point the measure to take it on the full state space. This, this needs some concavity. And finally, we already saw on the page before that this, on the left-hand side, we have, we have the upper approximation. And on the right hand, the lower approximation of, of, the, of the lower envelope of a continuous function. And so therefore, we have continuity of the entanglement measure. I just want to give you a slideshow without going into, into details about first applications to von Neumann entropy, which is notoriously discontinuous. Um, th and here, there's an approximation technique for more general lower, <coughs> lower semi-continuous concave functions, which gives a necessary end sufficient condition for every given subset of the state space to decide if on that set state space the von Neumann entropy is continuous or not. And there was also a recent result <coughs> on, the, on the output entropy. So we're given the uh, preserve appropriate pro proper property of the output entropy. It's another information characteristic which is <coughs> very um, well known in information theory. Um, here we have finiteness is preserved if and only if the convergence is preserved. Also, or the continuity is preserved. And this means that boundedness holds. So you see, this is very, very versatile method in, in analysis of density matrices and Hilbert spaces. And finally, because we were, we were talking about um, for Neumann entropy, I should mention the classical result by Fannes. We have a, indeed a uniform continuity bound <coughs> on, dense, on the von Neumann entropy. And this was, was recently indeed uh, generalized by Andreas Winter to, to infinite dimensional systems, under, again under restriction to, to an energy constraint. Here, in the case of, of um, Fannes, the dimension was crucial, and of course the dimension cannot be used anymore in the infinite dimensional case. The dimension is replaced by, by uh, entropy of a maximum entropy state of such a Gibbs state here. So I, I, I just wanted to point out that there's recently quite a lot of progress being made on, on continuity theory of, of, en of entropic functionals. And so it's placed for me now to go to the finite dimensional setting but I'm more at home. Um, the first thing to point out is going back to the history. Um, there was a work by Papadopoulou in 77. She was characterizing the stability for, <coughs> for finite dimensional compact convex sets. What, what, what can you say about them? Um, um, there's, there's a uh, very clever notion of, of, of phasal structures. So I'm going to talk about phases now. And the phase function introduced by Clay, Martin, and others, and studied ex in intensively, um, assigns to each point the union of closed segments whose interior segment lies on that bound, or is incident with that bound. And what, what we can say is also, alternatively, it's, it's just the phase to which to whose in relative interior the point belongs. I'll show you pictures later. Of course, this is a set value function. To study it, its continuity, we need a little, bom little more elaborate <laughs> work. And what we can do is, calling a functions, function um, lower semi-continuous, if for every point in an image set and every open set about that, we can find a neighborhood about the original point such that each of the image sets of, of in the neighborhood intersects the open point. And let's try if we can verify this later. But first, the theorem. <coughs> I think LSC for, for a numeric function is well known. It, it means that the hypergraph is closed. 
the epigraph is closed. And now the theorem says that stability is equivalent with the lower semi-continuity of the phase function and equivalent with the lower semi-continuity of the dimension of the phase function. So the best thing is to do an example where it does not hold. In that case, if we take a, a the, say to the sequence of the midpoints of the blue lines, <coughs> they converge to a point on the red line, um, but they will never meet the left part, so the faces of those points will never meet the left part of the red line, so they cannot possibly touch an open set there, and therefore this phase function is definitely not lower semi-continuous. As we can see it from the dimension function, there's a sequence of <coughs> exposed Oh, extreme points along along the along the circle, and what what it what it has to do is converge to that red point, and at that red point, the dimension of the phase function jumps to one because that point lies on a on a segment. So this is not lower semi continuous either. Good. Then I will try to find some. Uh, relation to inference. We have already seen inference, and I will use the result by Papadopoulou also in one of the results. Also, the lower semi continuity of the phase function is crucial in one of our necessary conditions of continuity. And what we can do here is we go back to the definition of an affine map from a space, compact space Y to a compact space K. And we look at the fiber of that affine map and we want to find a right inverse which, which picks out for every point in the image a point in the fiber by minimizing a function which can be a ranking function for the goodness of the choice. And okay, now it's a little bit technical because we need to talk about the constraints more explicitly. One way to do is it to use a space uh, orthogonal projection onto that. So one can use, why not, um, Hilbert Schmidt's inner product. And now going back to the, to the format definition, uh, we, we use as Y the space of density matrices and of course, the constraints are then parameterized by the image or projection of the density matrix on the chosen space. We can also take coordinates, which is more appropriate in some settings. And here, we, <coughs> we pick a number of three, two, or a K observables, Hamiltonians, energy operators, can also be measurement operators from a POVM. And what we do with them is we just compute the the Hilbert Schmidt in a product, which will give the average or the, the of, of, a, of an observable, or which can give the measurement probability of a, of a, of a measurement, measurement operator, what, what you prefer. Now, so this object which we now obtain doing coordinates is well known as the joint algebraic numerical range in dimension two numerical range, and is very well studied. We'll come back later to some aspects of that. So the first thing which you might remember is that there was a continuity condition by Festerström about the minimum in each fiber, and this carries over indeed to the, to the inference itself. So the affine map called phi is open Oh, there's a definition, okay. <laughs> I thought it's a theorem, sorry. So this is just a definition what it means, openness. Ah, because we have to go to the local problem now. Westerstrom did the same theory globally. He just talked about the openness of a map. And, and this is not useful because a map is certainly not usually everywhere discontinuous. There's just one, some, some sparse discontinuities. <coughs> so the theorem is here. It says that the, that the inference is discontinuous at the point uh, if and only if the fiber defining affine map is open on the image point. Okay, we can from that alone already deduce some properties because, for example, every uh, such map is open if you project to polytope, 
and can show that. And this happens, for example, for commutative observables. A second property is relative interior points are always safe. And then can do more abstract studies of that as well. But it's, of course, somewhere limited because we lose a lot of, a lot of information if we just look at the image. Mm. Now, now let's get back to Papadopoulos' result about the phase function. There's a necessary condition of <coughs> continuity, namely the phase function must be lower, sec lower semi-continuous, or let's say the phase function of the image which, pr which parameterizes the constraints. This would be no the numerical range, as the phase function of k must be lower semi-continuous along a uh, given se sequence. So how can you formalize that here? <coughs> we assume, of course, that y is stable in that setting. So the state space is stable. We have already discussed it. And we pick a point in, uh, in, in, in the numerical range or, or in the abstract setting we described here. And now we look at a sequence which, which converges to that point. And um, we just follow the inference values of that point. And they, they will converge if and only if the points which, con which, which lie on, on, the, on, the, on the parameterizing set K have, uh, the, if, 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 the, if they converge, then the parameterizing set ha has a lower semi-continuous phase function along that sequence. I show you at, a, at an example what I mean. So this is an example of uh, first found by Shien and Nakasato, later also uh, dis discussed in, in a group with collaborators, maybe myself. And the, here's some matrices, and you can see here a joint numerical range. What you really see is a surface and the object. So this corresponds to, corresponds to the set K. Uh, is the convex hull of that. So you see on the boundary there's one ellipse and one and one <laughs> segment. And and you s you will we, we'll agree that every sequence of extreme points which converges to that segment jumps in its dimension, phase dimension. So if it arrives as a limit point, then the phase dimension is one. The extreme point has phase dimension zero. So it means that all those points, the inference is necessarily discontinuous. And now uh, let's see what we can say about more specific examples. Let's go back to the quantum inference, um, to the proper notation, to have S was the, st the state space of density matrices, for example. We, we in introduce uh, relative entropy, which is an asymmetric distance measure. And we also <coughs> we try to um, mm, introduce uh, a ranking function, which is the negative <coughs> negative von Neumann entropy, or more generally, the relative entropy. So we really have, have here a ranking function, um, which, is, which is well known in, in uh, statistics, as far as I know. And, and as I said, it, 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 uh, it, it simplifies to the von Neumann maximum entropy inference by a simple calculation. And it's also well known how the maximizers look like of, of the von Neumann entropy and the linear constraints. They are just thermal states. So you can d write them down uh, as, a, as a family in that way. And so we have already a large part of, of, the, of, the, in, of the image of the inference map described, but something is missing because this map is well known also to be analytic. So where are the con discontinuities? <coughs> of course, we, see, we saw al already earlier they must be lie on the, on the relative boundary of the, of the domain uh, of the definition because in the relative interior this is continuous, but still they're missing some. So how can we, how can we find them? Um, now, to that aim, one, one should can, can use some theory, namely of information geometry, maybe, uh, to define an entropy distance from an exponential family of, 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 of density matrices. 
this is the, dis the distance, the entropy distance. And we can also define a reverse information closure, which was earlier defined mm, in work. I think it goes back to Jensov in the 80s and was then picked up by several people later. And in particular, Chisa and Matus have, have, have studied a large part of and promoted much of that, of that theory in applications, maximum likelihood estimation and other applications. When, there should, when, when, when the opinion is that some boundary points are missing, then one can construct such boundaries. And there are indeed boundary points missing, and if we add them, so if we go to the, to the, to the, to the closure here, which is defined by, by points which have zero distance from the family, then we, we have the standard notions of, of Pythagorean and projection theorems, which are well known from, this, from the elementary information geometry, if you want. You, can, you only need Klein inequality that the, that the relative entropy is non-negative and posit strictly positive for different arguments. And as the, the rest is clear, but it's not so clear if you go to the closure. And this theorem says you can also do it for the closure. <coughs> Okay, what I wanted to point out at that point is the Pythagorean theorem implies that now the closure of, of the exponential family is exactly, precisely the set, the image of the inference map, of the maximum entropy inference map. And what also we can say is that we can see where the discontinuity comes from. It comes from the fact that this image which is equal to the graph of the inference map, may not be closed in the norm topology. And that's the problem. So this is a second, a third condition. All of them, don't forget that, are related to the geometry of, of, of the state space and to the, to the st stability condition, which as we saw er so earlier. So you can already reduce these analytic problems if you want to a problem of geometry of state spaces in finite dimensions. Okay, now why should we look at, at those kind of inference maps? This is a good question. The, uh, one problem which I like is related to ground states. Um, I have used them implicitly for a long time, but did not realize them. I, I used, I used to, to use the maximization instead of the minimization before I realized this, <laughs> the ground state. So now one, one should use the the eigenvalue of the, of the smallest eigenvalue, then, then one has a ground state energy. And if we do this, then we already obtain a definition of, well, we see by, by a simple optimization problem that the smallest eigenvalue is exactly the, the distance of a supporting hyperplane of the space of density matrices from zero. And this is so-called support function, which is described here. And of course, you can do the projection. If you restrict to a subspace, then you can project the convex body in, in discussion, and you, you obtain a, a subspace and a projection on the subspace, where you can still use you describe the, the distance of a supporting hyperplane from the origin in terms of the eigenvalue, the smallest eigenvalue. Okay, you see, <coughs> this is already the definition of exposed phase, almost. Uh, we just replace the minimum by an arc minimum, and if we do that, we have the concept of exposed phase, which is the set of maximizers of a linear functional on, or minimizers of a linear functional. <coughs> on, a, on a convex set. So I, I need to introduce some further structure, otherwise it's difficult to make the connection. And here, it is also very well known by Cartesian, some work that the state spaces on, on studied in much more detail by, for example, Alfson and Schulz and, and others, that the state spaces of, of, of algebras, of star algebras are, are well understood in the C star case and the phenomenal algebra case. And in the simpler case of finite dimensional um, algebras, star algebras, we just have an identification of the exposed phases of the state space with the projection lattice of the algebra. <coughs> and again, we can, re we can restrict, ah, maybe I explain, 
that for every projection, we just take those states which are, which are supported on the, on the projection. So the image is included in the image of the projection. And if we do that, we, have, we obtain a, an isomorphism. <coughs> the lattice isomorphism can be projected down as well. And now the, it, it turns out that the exposed faces of a projected sp state space is, corresponds exactly to the ground space projections of elements in the, in, the, uh, in the vector space of our choice. And this was this defined here. So for every element of the vector space, you take the, its ground space projections and put it into the set. And then it turns out that the set is, is isomorphic as a lattice to the space of exposed phases. So what I wanted to say is <coughs> I wanted to make an example just to point out these connections. This may be a, seem a little bit abstract. Therefore, an example might be helpful. So we just take Pauli matrices, one, two, three. And now we take a, a star algebra, a real algebra in this case, to go down to dimension three and see something reasonable. And what we can find, well, first, uh, we can define a, 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 a special, special circle of, of pure states rho, and uh, which is already adapted to the to a unit to a subspace which I which I choose, and I already computed the projection lattice of that subspace. Here on the left hand side, I, I excluded the the sim the trivial projections, the zero and one, the smallest and greatest. And from the other projections which remain, you see that this, this is exactly that, cir that circle which I defined earlier, but the punctured circled circle. There's missing one point. And this point of of rank one projector is replaced by a projector of rank two. So you see this object is not closed anymore. You can see this in, the, in that picture. What is dis displayed is a cone here. This is the state space of the algebra, of the real star algebra. And of what you can also see in the basis of that cone is formed <coughs> by the rank one projections described a little bit earlier, what we can also see is that at that point here is, is a projection missing and instead we have a full, a full segment as an exposed phase in, in that cone which projects down or which is the inverse image of, of, of such boundary point under, under the inverse projection from the cone to the circle. And what can we see? There are two things to note, to point out. This missing point here, which is not in the projection lattice, it, it, it is in the closure of the projection lattice, certainly. And so you see this is an example of a projection lattice which is not closed. And one can also easily verify that, um, that the maximum entropy inference map is non-continuous because here, we obtain the maximum entropy state exactly on the midpoint of that segment. So when, you, when we run along this curve, the maximum entropy states lie all on such uh, a circle. And when we arrive here, suddenly it jumps from the circle up to the midpoint up. In that midpoint of the segment. Mm. There's a different um, approach to, to ground states, not only in terms of projections, also the energy levels it themselves can be, just can be studied. What we have here is two, two op op projections, uh, sorry, uh, two observables or Hermitian matrices F1, F2, and we take a, a curve, a circle in, inside of the, of the pencil spanned by them and what else can we do? We can apply the relic theorem and see there's a uh, sequence of eigenvectors which, which are par parameterized analytically of that matrix, which, is thus, which parameterizes just the curve in, in, the, in the pencil. And then we define a, a curve in, in, the, in the numerical range um, uh, just by 
k curves, not n curves, and the dimension of the of the of the of the Hilbert space, and uh, simple calculations give give us this. Okay, one needs here a little bit, a little bit perturbation theory, but this can be done, and. We see this is just a curve in the, in the numerical range in the projection of the state space. What is interesting, this curve suffices to generate all extreme points of that, of that image of the, of the <coughs> state space. And at these, yeah. Okay. At these points, we have a continuity con condition in terms of intersection. It means just um, if, if that, if that, um, inference map is continuous at one point, then necessarily the, the, um, uh, the ground, the, the not necessarily ground state, but the, the eigenvalue curves, the analytical eigenvalue curves, either they split already at order one, so they have different dungeons, or they do not, don't split at all. That's it. <laughs> and this is a, a condition, you can so look at the picture of, of eigenvalue crossings, and obtain a relation, in principle, back to the geometry of, of, of the state space, which is not very surprising if, if, you, if you think about that, that, the, that the support function of the state space is exactly the smallest eigenvalue. So it's clear that there's an, an, a, a connection, but it's not clear how it looks like, and especially not clear how it looks like in higher dimensions. And now in one minute, I just skip. No, I should not skip it. The local Hamiltonian problem is the problem to find the, the, the ground state energy of a local Hamiltonian. It's just one which, for example, on a lattice has limited interaction. And everybody interacts only with at most k parties. And these objects are still very hard to, to, to analyze. And for example, it's, it's a very hard problem to compute approximately uh, the ground state energy of such an ob object. Even, um, even if you allow such a, 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 an open limit which goes polynomially down to zero. <coughs> Therefore, it's not a new idea that the, the geometry of, 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 of this functional, of, of the ground state energy, should, should be studied. Also, there are some people who have studied that earlier. And what is the geometry of, of that ground state energy? Okay, at, as I told you, the ground state energy is the, the distance of hyperplanes from the from projected <coughs> space of density matrices, in that case projected to the local Hamiltonians. And this projected image to the local Hamiltonians is nothing but the k, log, the k party marginals. And so the aim is to study the geometry of k party marginals in, in that setting and finding some geometric approach to the to local Hamiltonian problem maybe, or at least to, this, to the area of, of, of ground state problems. And what does mean geometry? Uh, I would say why not studying the exposed phase lattice thesis, and was also done by other people. And this is, as I told, uh, told you, isomorphic to the projection lattice of ground states. Now I have to skip the example. Where I wanted to point it out with an GHC state, and just mention at the end that when, when, when we are at the, maybe I do this away, when we are at the level of discussing K local Hamiltonians, we can also discuss Hamilt also the corresponding states which have limited interaction. And um, the distance from such limited interaction states then necessarily has has a meaning of complexity, and so the, the continuity of such complexity measures is also related to, to the continuity of the inference, this final remark. Okay, thank you.